Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous Class and Archetypes Basic Overview Series where we take a look at every class and archetype from the games, the DLC, the mods, all over the place and talk about what makes them tick. And today, our episode is the Ranger. And in case you haven't been able to tell, it's going to be about as long as a oh, that episode was. <laughs> I think it's safe to say the Ranger, in terms of modding, was a pretty popular character amongst, a class, I should say, amongst the modders. And that's uh, saying quite a bit, considering the rocky history Ranger seems to have had in tabletop games. I know it wasn't exactly a beloved class in <laughs> um, third edition, at least before 3.5 came and fixed some things. And I know, I wouldn't say the class as a whole was hated in fifth edition, but the the Beastmaster, <laughs> arch uh, yeah, archetype, had to get uh, changed around a bit. And honestly, I mean, the only way you'll ever get me to be a ranger in the classic Baldur's Gate games is if you let me be an archer, because everything else feels kind of half-baked. But that's not to say the ranger isn't a cool class in and of itself. Essentially a druidic form of the paladin, if you know what I mean by that. The ranger is well known for either being a long distance archer or a character who uses two weapon fighting, one of the more common classes to do it. In fact, it even it's even featured as one of their combat styles, which lets you pick up some feats for free, which kind of determines what kind of ranger you're going to be. But what is it about the ranger that really makes it special? Well, let's go ahead and take a look. To start off with, rangers are depth skirmishers, blah, blah, blah. I'll let you hear that later. Uh, fortitude is high, the will is low, and reflex is high. Base attack bonus is high. You get a hit dice of 10 and an average of 60 points per level. Max level of spells is only 4. Caster ability is wisdom, and you memorize your spells. And your class skills are athletics, persuasion, lore nature, knowledge world, stealth, perception, and knowledge arcana. Oh, nice to see this class gets athletics. Isn't that right? Paladin! Anyway. <laughs> so to start off with, ranger proficiencies are pretty much a fighter, except you don't get heavy armor. Which sounds like it sucks, but trust me, there's a method to that madness. Uh, to start off with, you get uh, the ranger signature enemy, enemy the <laughs> ability, the favored enemy. At first level, a ranger selects a creature type from the ranger favored enemies list. He gains a plus two bonus on weapon attack and damage rolls against them. At fifth level, and every five levels thereafter, 10, 15, to 20th, the ranger may select an additional favored enemy. In addition, at each such interval, the bonus against any one favored enemy, including the one just selected if so desired, increases by plus two. If the ranger chooses humanoids, or outsiders as a favorite enemy, he must also choose an associated subtype as indicated on the table below. If a specific creature falls into more than one category of favorite enemy, the ranger's bonuses do not stack, he simply uses whichever bonus is higher. And yeah, there's, uh, as I said, with uh, humans, you can't just pick humanoids, you have to pick humans, halflings, fey, blah, 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 so there's a lot of choices here. But you'll notice uh, in particular, Probably because the, you know, developers didn't want you getting too much of an advantage over the most common enemy type of the game. The demons are actually categorized into three uh, subtypes. Demons of strength, demons of slaughter, and demons of magic. I have no idea what the difference is between these two, but I guess it doesn't really matter too much. But yeah, there's definitely quite a few enemies uh, that fit the list here. Unsurprisingly, uh, people would definitely pick the demons for sure, but it sucks because you have to pick all three of them, and, you know, you won't be able to get all the bonuses to line up quite so easily. But there's another class out that will uh, solve that problem for us, and we'll talk about that one in a bit. But for now, we move on to level 2, where we get a combat style feat. A ranger must select one combat style to pursue. A ranger's expertise manifests in the form of bonus feats at 2nd, 6th, 10th, 14th, and 18th level. He can choose feats from a selected combat style list, even if he does not have the normal prerequisites. Every style can also choose following feats. Dodge, Great Fortitude, Lightning, Reflexes, and Toughness. So the five styles that you can pick out are Archery, which lets you select from Point Blank Shot, Precise Shot, and Rapid Shot. Sixth level lets you add Improved Precise Shot, Point Blank, Master, and Mini Shot to the list. And at tenth level you get Improved Critical to the list. Menacing, which, um, okay, that's not a combat style, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> 
level. A ranger can select from dazzling display, power attack, and intimidating cars. At 6th level, he adds Cornagon Smash and Shatter Defenses to the list, and at 10th level, he adds Dreadful Carnage and Improved Critical to the list. Weapon and Shield! This is actually kind of different. I didn't expect a ranger to get this, but whatever. At 2nd level, the ranger can select from Shield Bash, Shield Focus, and Weapon Fighting. At 6th level, he adds Improved to Weapon Fighting and Shield Master to the list, and at 10th level, he adds Bashing Finish and Greater to Weapon Fighting to the list. Next up is Two-Handed Weapon, Be Like Aragorn. At 2nd level, the ranger can select from Cleave, Power Attack, and Intimidating Prowess. At 6th level, he adds Cleaving Finish and Great Cleave to the list, and at 10th level, he adds Dreadful Carnage and Critical Focus to the list. And finally, with Two-Weapon Combat, at 2nd level, the ranger can select from Double Slice, Shield Bash, and Two-Weapon Fighting. At 6th level, he adds Improved Two-Weapon Fighting to the list, and at 10th level, he adds Greater Two-Weapon Fighting to the list. Doesn't sound like it has, a. Uh, many choices as the others, but then again, fighting with two weapons does let you uh, have a whole extra attack at a great penalty, which can often make, make the difference between, uh, you know, winning a fight and losing it, so still pretty cool. So I absolutely love the variety, and, you know, I'm honestly looking at this, I'm kind of surprised that uh, the fighter didn't get, um, you know, anything similar to this, though in all fairness, the fighter does have its own uh, specialties that make it stand out. So now we're going to move on to the third ability, the favorite terrain. Another signature ability of the ranger. You already know how I feel about this one. A ranger may select a type of terrain. The ranger gains a plus two bonus on initiative checks and guard nature perception and skill, stealth, skill checks when he is in the terrain. At eighth level, of every five levels after, the ranger may select an additional favorite terrain. In addition, at each such interval, the skill bonus initiative bonus in any one favorite terrain, including one just selective, so desired, increases by two. You can choose between the abyss, the desert, the forest, the highlands, the underground, and an urban, and astral if you have a mod, which, why is this here? I don't think there's any point in the game where you go to the astral plane, but whatever. Okay, I'm gonna talk about this for a second. It's not that I hate favorite terrain. I actually, I'm not gonna lie, I really do like the idea of this being something that can, um, you know, uh, allow the ranger to, you know, show off his more type of outdoorsman uh, personality. What do you want, you stupid phone? Anyway, again, I really do like it. What I don't like, especially considering we're playing a video game where everything is pretty much preset, is that I feel like this is an ability that's much more preferable to tabletop players simply because it's one of those things where it's like, you know, you can work with your dungeon master with whatever favorite terrain you want to use, and the dungeon master can try to kind of plan some sessions around those specific areas, particularly sessions where, you know, you get to have a bit more involvement with the story. And, ch and hell, chances are you might be playing in a type of terrain that, you know, makes up the whole campaign. And, you know, it's pretty easy to uh, select your favorite terrain there. And moreover, even in those situations, it's kind of like, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, uh, so you're out in the desert, but then you go into a city in the desert. Do you use desert or earth? <laughs> I think it just kind of depends on the nature of the area. But it's just one of those things where it's like a specific, uh, you know, when you have a video game that has its, you know, own put together campaign that you can't really work together with. It, for me, feels like something that's very hard to work with because at some points you'll have that favorite terrain bonus and then at other points you won't, you know. So it's one of those things where either you pick the ones that you like, but you're not able to see the area as much. And then, of course, you have to go through, <laughs> you know, the areas in the game, likely pick the ones in a specific order, and it's just like, it kind of takes the fun out of it. It feels a little bit, you know, video gamey in that sense, which is ironic because we're playing a video game. But I just kind of feel like if it were up to me, and I know this probably sounds boring and even a bit it's too streamlined, but if I were designing the Ranger, I would take all these bonuses cut them in half, just plus one for every threshold, but allow the ranger access to them for as long as he's outside. I know that sounds a bit, <laughs> it sounds a bit, you know, like, wait, the ranger's really been around the world that much? It's just for me, the ranger feels like a character that, you know, 
would easily be able to, you know, adapt to any sort of terrain he's in and figure things out in ways that other characters can't because he's more used to being out in the world, foraging for himself and all that stuff. That's just my kind of complaint with the ability. And it's, but that's not to say I don't like what it has to offer. I love the skill bonuses and even the initiative checks. I mean, the initiative in and of itself is humongously powerful. And the skills that you get are actually really useful, not only, you know, when you're fighting enemies, but also out on the map. I mean, lore nature delays your fatigue. Perception uh, helps you spot ambushes. Stealth skill helps you, you know, prevent ambushes. And even if it's high enough, you can even lower uh, the amount of random encounters you have against enemies. It's just, you know, it's, it's really, really cool. I just don't like how it's implemented. And that's just my, you know, one big issue with this class. Do I think it's terrible because of that? Of course not. I think it's a really, you know, cool idea as a whole. I guess, I don't know. At least in a video game, since I wish it was a bit more streamlined. But, I mean, feel free to tell me how you feel about it. <laughs> um, in addition to level 3, we also get inert. Harsh conditions or long exertions do not easily tire you. You gain plus 4 bonus on fortitude saves against fatigue and exhaustion, a plus 2 bonus on athletics checks. If you have two or more ranks in athletics, the bonus increases to plus 4 for that skill. You may sleep in light or medium armor without becoming fatigued, which is pretty cool. And also, <laughs> let's get Minotaur's, Minotaur's Church ability, which I'm pretty sure came from a mod, but but that's still a really cool idea. Um, I'm doubtful that Fortitude saves play a point in becoming fatigued or exhausted when you're traveling on the map, because you got to sleep sooner or later. But regardless, it's a nice thing to have, and... I'm pretty sure it does benefit you against certain magic abilities that can cause fatigue and exhaustion, so that's a nice thing to have. And at level 4, we get Hunter's Bond. Sound familiar? Yeah, it's just like the Paladin's Bond. Uh, Ranger forms a bond with his hunting companions. This bond can take one of two forms. Once a form is chosen, it cannot be changed. The first is a bond to his companions. This bond allows him to spend a move action to grant half his favorite enemy's bonus against a single target of the appropriate type to all allies within 30 feet who can see or hear him. This bonus lasts for a number of rounds, equal to the Ranger's, Ranger's Wisdom modifier, minimum of one. This bonus does not stack with any favorite enemy bonuses possessed by his allies. They use whichever bonus is higher. The second option is to form a close bond with an animal companion. A Ranger who selects an animal companion can choose one from the list of available creatures. This animal is a loyal companion that accompanies Ranger on his adventures as appropriate for his kind. A Ranger's animal companion shares his favorite enemy and favorite terrain bonuses. This ability functions like the Druid Animal Companion, except the Ranger's effective Druid level is equal to his range level, minus three. So, uh, make sure you grab that Boon Companion as soon as possible. I think between this and the Paladin's Bond, I actually like this one a little bit more. You know, granted you can't make your weapon or armor or whatever as powerful, but there's plenty of high, uh, you know, level, level weapons that you can find within the game. This one, by comparison, gives you a bonus, you know, that stretches to the entire party and while it's no mark of justice it's still a really nice thing to have that can you know <clears throat> help your enemy uh allies get rid of those particularly tough enemies it's it's really kind of cool an interesting idea of course you know it's us to compete with the animal companion uh so <laughs> i don't know if it's much better than having an animal companion but it's still a cool idea regardless At level set, uh, 9, sorry, we get Evasion. A character can avoid even magical and unusual attacks with great agility. If a character makes successful with a flex saving throw against an attack that normally deals half damage, he instead takes no damage, helps the character does not gain the benefits of Evasion. And then at level 15, you gain Improved Evasion, uh, which allows you to take only half damage on failed saves. So that's a really powerful ability for sure. No surprise there, pretty awesome. And then at level 11, we get Quarry. A character can, as a standard action, denote one target within his line of sight as a quarry. He receives a plus two insight bonus on attack rolls made against his quarry, and all critical threats are automatically confirmed. A character can only have no more than one quarry at a time. Insight bonuses are one that I don't see anywhere near as often as other bonuses like luck or lore, so this is something that will definitely stack with a lot of those. So this is definitely a welcome bonus, and it's nice to see that it's still useful, even if you're a cheap-ass noob like me and mod critical attacks <laughs> to always confirm. So really, really nice ability. And then at level 19, we get improved quarry. 
At 19th level, the character's ability to hunt his quarry improves. He can now select a quarry as a free action, and his insight bonus to attack his quarry increases to plus four. I wish it came sooner. Like, maybe level 17 at the earliest, just so, you know, you don't feel like you're getting overloaded with evasion. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 like, I like 17, because aside from a feat, you don't get much else there, so I kind of like that a little bit more, but that's just my opinion. And then finally, at level 20, we get the Capstone ability, which for the Ranger specifically... Actually, there's another one here, which is kind of hilarious. Uh, but Master Hunter. A Ranger of 20th level becomes a Master Hunter. He can, as a standard action, make a single attack against a favorite enemy as a full attack bonus. If the attack hits, the target takes damage normally and must make a fortitude to fort save or die. <laughs> yeah, you're an Inquisitor. <laughs> DC of the save is equal to 10 plus half the Ranger's level. Plus, the Ranger was a modifier. The Ranger can use his ability once per day against each of his favorite enemy types. He can't use against the same creature more than once in a 24 hour period. Now, you might think, you know, it doesn't sound particularly amazing, but when you consider the fact that, um, you know, you get a favorite enemy bonus that you can use this against, even if it's not likely that, you know, you'll be able to beat their fortitude save. The fact that you're more that much more likely to hit the enemy is a really nice thing, and I feel like this gels pretty well with the class. So, how do I feel about the ranger? It's honestly a really cool class. You know, I've always been a sucker for ranged uh, character types in this game, and this just kind of allows you to take that uh, feeling of being a master archer and really turn it up to 11. So, a lot of cool stuff with this thing. And of course, you know I love classes that get free animal companions, so definitely a good choice for me on the list. Now that being said, considering this is Wrath of the Righteous, you can't beat the Demon Slayer. Remember in the last episode when I said the Paladin was practically tailor-made for this game? And now I hinted at a class that, you know, was tailor-made for this game even more? This is that class. Paladin was practically tailor-made. Demon Slayer is actually Tailor made. Let's talk about this baby. Demon Slayers are known for their expertise in the destruction of demons. <laughs> I love how simple that is. It's like, it's a demon slayer. What do you want? <laughs> anyway. So, in terms of what we lose and in terms of what we gain. So, we lose, unfortunately, the favorite enemy, which sounds bad, but there's a better version of it that comes up a little bit later. We also lose Endurance, which, eh, it sucks, but there's other ways you can beef up your Fortitude saves. Um, and then, last but not least, I don't think we actually lose anything else. So, let's talk about what we get. In place of your original favorite enemy, you get Demon Slayer favorite enemy. At first level, a Demon Slayer must choose favorite enemy Evil Outsider. At fifth level, and every time he advances his favorite enemy bonus, the Demon Slayer must advance his bonus against Evil Outsiders. In addition to the normal benefits of favorite enemy, the Demon Slayer gains a bonus to equal to half his favorite enemy bonus on saving throws against spells, spell-like abilities, and supernatural abilities of e uh, Evil Outsiders. So in addition to being able to hit these creatures easily, he also gets a defensive bonus against them, which is really nice to have, especially against those blasts that suck you by that love to try and charm you. At fourth level, we get an expanded spell list! All two of them! <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you've already got someone that can cast it, it's not exactly going to do you, do you all that much good. But I will say this. As protection from evil communal is the one protection spell that I typically use all the time, it's nice to have someone you know, that gets extra access to it for free and kind of lets you get more uh, divine casters with more spell variety, gives them a chance to try some other different things. And it's a really good choice for a character that doesn't have that many spell levels anyway, just so, you know. <clears throat> but yeah, it's, it, it definitely works, you know. <laughs> it's like, you're already getting lots of defenses against the enemy yourself, but hey, go give everybody else some more. So that's pretty cool. Here's where the fun begins, at 4th level. Favorite enemy, Demons of Magic. This works exactly like Favorite Enemy Outsider and exists for existing build compatibility. If you already have this feature, continue taking ranks to progress Favorite Enemy Outside properly. You basically get all three of these automatically, which is fan-fucking-tastic. 
In a game that is filled to the brim with demons, the Demon Slayer is there to take care of them all. And you don't even need a stupid smite evil to get the job done. It is so good. Definitely, yeah, like I said, pretty much built for this game in the way that the Defender of the True World was built for King Maker. At level 11. Uh, let's see. Actually, there's one more thing down here. At level 3, we get Demonologist. The Demon Slayer gains insight into his abyssal enemies. The Demon Slayer gains a bonus equal to half his class level on Arden's Arcana skill checks. So, you're really good at identifying items. So, that's definitely nice to have. At level 11, you get Fiendish Quarry. When a Demon Slayer chooses an evil outsider versus Quarry, he can forego the normal plus 2 attack bonus and instead treat his weapon as if it were good aligned versus his Quarry. Considering that there are a lot of enemies that have damage reduction, any number slash good, this is actually a really good uh, ability to have. It doesn't sound all that great, considering you have to forego the normal plus two attack bonus, but considering you're getting all kinds of crazy attack and damage bonuses against them to begin with, I feel like that's a moot point. So the only bad part is that it's um, all the way at level 11. Meanwhile, some casters get, like, a line weapon way earlier than that, so... It's just, like, a delayed... <clears throat> a delayed ability until you don't have to worry about that spell. So it doesn't add all that much, but it's just nice for the character to have, and really uh, fits with their roleplay. Oh, hell, and I also forgot about this one in the original Ranger. Uh, 12th level higher can, as a move action, use a stealth kill to hide any of his favorite terrains, even in combat, so... Uh, that's not bad at all. That's a nice thing to have. If you need it. And then finally, at level 19, you get improved Fiendish Quarry. When a Demon Slayer chooses an evil outsider, you can forego the normal plus four attack bonus and instead use his weapon as if it had the Holy Weapon special ability when attacking his quarry. Holy Weapons, of course, do extra damage to any evil enemy. And it even makes a weapon good aligned to bypass damage reduction, so that's really, really, really awesome. So, yes, definitely a good choice there. So, is the Demon Slayer better than the Ranger? I don't know. Does a bear shit in the woods? <laughs> I mean, so let's be fair here. In this, like I said, the Demon Slayer was specifically made for this game. If you were to put this in a game where demons were, like, not at all the typical enemy, then it wouldn't have much to offer. But the fact that it works the way it does in this game pretty much makes it an absolute shoe in I mean... <laughs> I mean, what... what and, and, and the best part about it is everything it offers, I mean... The only real bad part is that there are some enemies that aren't demons that this ranger is probably going to struggle against. And, I mean, losing endurance isn't all that big a deal. So, I think the biggest weakness is that this uh, character just is just far less uh, versatile than a regular ranger. But that being said, because there's so many demons to begin with, it's just, it's very difficult to, you know, <clears throat> to pass up this uh, class that's built with this game in mind. It's just such a cool idea. Um, I mean, slandered put this game at the very top of his uh, class rankings list for a reason, and I can uh, easily see why. So yeah, if you want to play a ranger, a demon slayer, it, you, you can't go wrong with it at all. Next up from the Prestige Plus mod, we have the Divine Marksmen. Divine Marksmen are masters of archery and touched by the light of the sword. Man. I sure do love these really, <laughs> these really uh, easy descriptions. So to start off with, as far as what you lose, you unfortunately lose improved uh, quarry and improved quarry, and you also lose all of your combat style feats. What are we gonna do? And also, you can't cast spells. Oh no. <laughs> well, that sucks. But as far as what you gain, and aside from that, it's all that's up here. So. At level 1, you get Bullseye Shot. You slow your breath, calm yourself, and hit the bullseye just as you were trained to do. You can spend a move action to steady your shot. When you do, you gain a plus 4 bonus on your next range attack roll before the start of your next turn. Um, this is essentially an archery feat for people who hate having to deal with the outflank teamwork feat. Because, you know, you basically just have to give up your uh, movement ability to get a bonus on your next range attack roll. Um... Considering the fact that the rangers I've played in the past are usually able to get lots of attacks on, I honestly kind of prefer just, you know, 
taking the whole turn to get a full attack bonus and hit the enemy as as frequently as possible. So I don't necessarily find a lot of use for this. Though, if you are fighting an enemy that has, you know, particularly high armor class, I can definitely see where this would come in handy. Personally, I think the best place to put this bullseye shot, which I'm pretty sure is a modded feat, by the way, is not particularly in any of these rangers, but actually with the uh, kinetic sharpshooter. Because, I mean, you know, when you <clears throat> use any sort of you know, kinetic a sharpshooter ability that uh, puts burn, you're basically, you know, restricted to just one shot to begin with. So getting that plus four on that one shot can be really, really helpful. I think that gels much better. That's not to say it's a bad ability. It's nice to have, you know, in certain situations. It just kind of sucks when you're not able to, you know, shoot as frequently as you want to. That's enough. At level two, you get archery automatically. Yes, you <laughs> you don't get to actually choose a combat style feat. You're an archer through and through. For me, this is not bad at all. I love archery, but for those of you who would prefer a more melee-oriented ranger, this is probably not going to be your cup of tea, so do with that what you will. And level four, and uh, you get Vicious Aim, and I love how creative they were with the icon. <laughs> a Divine Marksman adds half of his highest favored enemy bonus to all attack rolls and damage rolls for attacks made with ranged weapons. This does not stack with his normal favorite enemy bonus, Grown, when targeting a creature that qualifies as favorite enemy. This ability replaces all spellcasting, and a marksman is not considered to have a caster bubble. So, that kind of sucks. But the fact that you get half your favorite enemy bonus to every enemy in a game, that's not bad at all. It's a nice little, it definitely, you know, allows you to put that much more effort into your archery and that you have a ability that kind of complements your, you know, otherwise more restrictive favorite enemy list is really nice to have. At level 6, you get another archery feat. At level 8, you get Iomene's Influence. A divine marksman gains weapon focus with the longsword as a bonus feat due to the influence of the Church of Iomene Oas over ill Illusurian causes. I'm just going to say it right now. This is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Look, I get it. Yes, you have to have a melee backup. For, for dude, you're a divine marksman. What are you a sword for? Just grab another fighter and let them look. I don't fucking know. I think it's incredibly dumb. In fact, why even, you know, say that you're automatically Iomedes chosen if you don't even put that in the name of the class? Anybody remember Champion of Corn for crying out loud? I don't know. I, th I think... It's it's okay, I guess. Again, melee backup. But for me, I like to keep my archers arching as much as possible. So, yeah. I just... I feel like this was put in for roleplay purposes and not much else. So, yeah. Not my favorite ability. At level 11, you get pinpoint targeting. You can target the weak points in your opponent's armor. As a standard action, make a single range attack. The target does not gain any armor, natural armor, or shield bonuses to its armor class. You do not gain a benefit of this feat if you move this round, which kind of sucks. But this right here, this is really good. In fact, it actually makes this feat look like absolute garbage. <laughs> In all fairness, though, I mean, having something like this at level one does feel a little overpowered. So I kind of feel like um, this is one of those things where if you have an enemy that's just got crazy high armor from its you know, armor bonuses alone, this is something that can really, uh, oops, wrong, can really help you, uh, land those hits, so, yeah. Uh, let's see, you get another archery feat, and another archery feat, and last but not least, you get quarry. Yes, you get regular quarry. A level 19. Thanks, game. Thanks a lot. Finally, and yeah, you have an archery feat there. So, is the Divine Marksman better than a Ranger? Well, if you plan on using a bow, I would say yes in the grand scheme of things. Except that you really don't get much else. I mean, you lose out on all these extra combat feats, which kind of sucks. But <laughs> you still get all the range one, which is not bad at all. It kind of, you know, places the strength of your class for sure. But... Again, aside from, like, Vicious Aim, it doesn't really seem to add a whole heck of a lot else. Having that half uh, favorite enemy attack bonus to all other enemies in the game is, as I said before, a really nice compliment to have. Um, 
It's not gonna make you the, you know, most powerful damage earned in the game. But still, it's it, it's good for what it is. Um, and then the bullseye shot and pinpoint targeting, they're not bad feats to have. They're certainly useful in their own way. Um, they could help you with accuracy. It's just, you gotta bear in mind that you're sacrificing some damage, so you have to, you know, think very carefully about whether, you're, when you're gonna use one of the these abilities or not. It's, it's kind of too bad that they don't let you at least make, I don't know, a couple shots. <laughs> or maybe, you know, an upgrade that could let you, like, shoot two arrows at once, like the the many shot feat does. That would, the many shot feat, if you could get that for free, that would be really, really nice. In fact, actually, you can, which is great. <laughs> but it's not until later in the... Actually, no, it's actually not that far in, is it? Cool. Uh, so, yeah. If you are looking for that uh, big time range, um, range build, Divine Marksman isn't terrible. But again, you do give up your spell casting, which wrecks your utility, and especially you don't get improved quarry and regular quarry comes late, which can really hurt. So, I mean, it gives you some nice benefits for the most part, but I kind of feel like you could do just about as good with a basic ranger build alone. So, but if you re if you really do like the bow and arrow, it can it can help though. So just you know. Take these bonuses with what you will. It's just not a whole lot that you get in exchange for it, so. Next up is the Divine Tracker. Blessed by his deity, a Divine Tracker hunts down those he deems deserving of his retribution. His weapon is likely to find purchase in his favorite enemy. Before I forget, it's worth noting that this is part of the Expanded Content 2022 mod. Uh, so to start off with, what do we lose? We really don't lose that much. We just lose our our animal companion, which absolutely sucks. <laughs> it really does. I mean, even if you're fighting from far away, the fact that you get an animal that can fight alongside you is really cool. So it does kind of suck that we don't get that. Uh, in terms of what we gain, though, we gain a few things. First off, we gain a favored weapon. A divine tracker becomes proficient with the favored weapon of his deity, if not already proficient. If his deity's favored weapon is an unarmed strike, he instead gains improved unarmed strike as a bonus feat. Uh, it's okay, I guess. I mean, <clears throat> it is nice that you get, uh, it's just the problem is it really only helps if you're, if the deity you're worshipping has, like, an exotic weapon, because you already get simple and martial weapons to begin with, so you kind of have to be a bit creative with your deity choice, which can, which can impact your, uh, roleplay, if that's something that bothers you. Next up at level 4, we get Tracker's Blessings. At 4th level, a Divine Tracker forms a close bond with his deity's ethos. He selects two War Priest domains from among the domains granted by his deity and gains the minor blessings of those domains. A Divine Tracker can select an alignment domain, Chaos, Evil, Good, or Law, only if his alignment matches that domain. And a Divine Tracker uses his Ranger level as his War Priest level to determine the effect of the blessing. At 13th level, a Divine Tracker gains a Mazer Blessing from both. Don't mean so it's essentially a delayed blessing and the idea of a war priest and also it's listed well yeah because you get two domains i i get it whatever so there's not much else to talk about here in terms of whether i think it's better than the ranger uh, yeah i'm not seeing rooms <laughs> not seeing a whole heck of a lot in all fairness though the fact that you get uh domains can really help you uh give you some nice Abilities to play around with the ranger and find that uh, find those extra powers that you feel can really help uh, make your divine tracker stronger. So that's that's certainly a good thing, and you get and you still get your spell casting of, among all things, which is really nice as well. And I mean, the favorite weapon's okay. Like I said, I would pick something that's exotic just because you don't have access to it, unlike every single other weapon in the game. So if you do like uh, war three domains and don't mind not getting an animal. This could be a good choice. Just bear in mind, animal companions are really nice to have in this game. Next up, also from the Expanded Content 2022, and another one of those classes that I'm excited to talk about because of the Gold Dragon update, the Drake Warden. Some rangers specialize in dealing with rambunctious younger drakes, protecting them and teaching them to tolerate and even trust humanoid creatures. <laughs> good luck with that. 
These Drake Wardens follow and pass along secret techniques for facing Drakes effectively, and thanks to their method, their Drakes are both fiercely loyal and extremely useful for scouting and stealth missions. Also kicking the crap out of your enemies, but hey. Uh, so, to start off with, we lose the Hunter's Wand. Oh no, that's bad! But wait, we get something in exchange for that. We also lose three ranks of favorite enemy, so we're not going to be, you know, as <clears throat> versatile in combat as enemies. And we also lose one rank of favorite terrain. Oh no, whatever what we do. In terms of what we gain, though... We get a Drake Warden Bond. At 4th level, a Drake Warden gains a Drake Companion instead of an Animal Companion, but his Drake's level is equal to his range level, minus 3. Again, get that Boon Companion going. So, needless to say, there's a lot of uh, choices here. Pretty sure the Umbra one is added through mods, which is basically your negative energy dragon. But aside from that, as I've heard, Drake Companions are really, really nice to have. And thanks to the mod, you can even write them in this game if that's something you want to do. So, one of the few choices that I feel can really compete with the dog or the wolf even if they can't just trip things right out of the gate the fact that they have a breath weapon is still really nice and can definitely help add some uh extra options in combat and well that's pretty much it <laughs> what you say is what you get that's literally all you get with the drake warden so it doesn't really sound all that much of a good class i personally think it's I would say it's weaker in the grand scheme of things than the Ranger, considering you lose a lot of favorite enemy bonuses, which definitely sucks, and the favorite terrain, which isn't really that much big of a loss. But I will say, I think it's worth trying just because the Drake Warden is, uh, <clears throat> Drakes are such cool uh, animal companions, <laughs> as it were. <laughs> More like mythical beast companion. That works. And I've tried out a Drake before, and they are definitely fun to work with, you know. They don't get quite the leg up as the uh, Draconic Scholars Arcanist does. But still, the fact that you get one is a really cool idea and can definitely make for some uh, fun thematic roleplay ideas. So I think it's definitely worth trying. Not quite as strong as the Ranger, but hey, the Drake can definitely change all that. Next up, we get the Espionage Experts. Arusale's base class in the game, if you don't throw in mods, otherwise it becomes a rogue, which is even better in my opinion, but anyway, these favorite uh, rangers' favorite hunting grounds aren't woods or mountains, but cities, streets, and enemy headquarters. These masterful spies hunt for secrets, rather than meat, using lies and stealthiness as effectively as blades and arrows. Wow, that sounds just like a regular ranger! <laughs> okay, okay, I get what they mean by that, but still, I mean... Who says he can't perform espionage outside a city? I don't know, that sounds kind of weird. But anyway, to start off with, you lose Endurance, which, I mean, that kind of makes sense because you've been in the city all your life. You also lose all your favorite terrain, which I actually don't like this. Uh, and if anything, I kind of wish that rather than just losing all your favorite terrain, you just got the urban one automatically. Don't you think it's a little weird that an espionage expert that's you know, specializes in doing their work in cities, doesn't get urban as their favorite terrain? Man, he be too powerful. Dude, shut the hell up. <laughs> it would be perfect. It would be awesome. In fact, I keep wondering if Illusioneer counts as an urban area rather than Abyssal, but that's just me. That would be really cool if it did, though. And then you also lose your animal companion, Roan. And you also don't get your base capstone. You get an alternate one. And you also lose camouflage, which... Uh, really? Who's camouflage? What if you're able to dress up in a color similar to... I don't know. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It, it, nothing, it's nothing... It's not a big loss because stealth isn't exactly all that great in this game. So, yeah. So, let's see what we gain in exchange for that. Well, you get trap finding. An espionage expert gains bonus equal to half her level on perception checks, checks, and trickery checks. So, hooray, you got yourself a trap disabler. You can leave the rogue at home. <laughs> and at level three, we get undercover. An espionage expert gets a bonus equal to half her level on persuasion when you use bluff and stealth checks. So, uh, considering that, you know, bluffing is something you can do in conversations, that's a nice thing to have for a lead character. And again, stealth isn't, yeah the greatest thing in this game. But the fact that you get a uh, bonus to it is still really nice. 
And then at level four, you get Ranger's Bond. A Ranger forms a bond with his regular companions. So you don't get the animal companion one, but you still get the party one, which is not bad at all. Especially considering that you get all of your favorite enemy bonuses, which is good. And then last but not least, you get Espionage Expert Magic! While using, while well, usually, fucking hell, Rangers use their wisdom to cast divine spells. Espionage experts use the power of their personality! The main casting ability for this Espionage Expert is Charisma. Note, however, this is one of the very few moments where a Charisma caster does not spontaneously cast. This one still memorizes their spells, so bear that in mind. Moreover, you also get Use Magic Device and Knowledge World as your uh, skills. However, you don't get Lore Nature, so bear that in mind, unfortunately. Uh, so, and let's see, one more thing here, I think. Yes, the Capstone, Espionage Master. An Espionage Master of 20th level becomes an Espionage Master. Thanks. <laughs> you know, I should play, like, if I'm ever in a uh, tabletop Pathfinder game, I should just take this class, and when my DM says I get that ability at level 20, I should just ask him if I can cross out expert on the character sheet and write master instead. <laughs> Anyways, you can, as an standard action, make a single attack bonus against a favorite enemy or a full attack bonus. If the attack hits, the target takes damage normally and must make a fortitude save or die. Oh, okay. You, yeah. Ooh. Anyway, uh, actually, it is better, though, because... You use the Espionage's Expert Charisma modifier, so kill them with kindness. If looks could kill. However, you an Espionage Expert can use this ability five times per day. Now that is huge. You can't use it against the same creature more than once in a 24-hour period, which kind of sucks. But the fact that you get it that many times, that's a huge upgrade to the uh, over the regular Ranger. You only have to wait 20 godforsaken levels just to get <laughs> what's it just ah that sucks um um however this one says ranger can use this ability once per day against each of his favorite enemy types which you get five of total which you know uh the espionage master isn't really a major upgrade however what i like is that with the espionage master you don't have to use it against your favorite enemy types so that's something worth noting. So it's a little bit more versatile, but you just have to be wary of what enemy you're going after because he might not get your uh, favorite type bonus in that regard. So do I think this class is better than the Ranger? Mm. Uh, well, kind of. It's not, I mean, it's not terrible. You know, the charisma thing isn't a huge deal. You just got to bear in mind that that's going to come at the cost of not having uh, high will saves, and uh, Ranger already has low will saves to begin with, so that's something you're going to have to watch out for. Um, the half-level bonuses to Perception and Trickery and Stealth and Persuasion are still very uh, useful to use. In fact, considering that it's bluff only, I wouldn't be surprised if the Espionage Expert was a pretty good choice for a Trickster Mythic Path. Um, but other than that, it's not too different. Um... I guess, I mean, I think for me, it's ultimately weaker just because you don't get an animal companion. And while I'm not a big fan of uh, favorite terrain to begin with, the fact that you lose it entirely is not very good. Because then you don't get any of those handy initiative bonuses at all. You'll have to kind of, you know, search elsewhere for those. So, I kind of feel like this is a class that can do some cool things, but nothing that really allows it to push past the ranger in any particular sense. I think if you want your ranger to be a uh, <clears throat> handy dandy skill monkey, this is a good choice, but aside from that, I don't think you're missing too much. Next up, the Flame Warden. Emulating the Blazing Phoenix, Flame Warden sweep through the world like a selective forest fire, <laughs> burning away corruption, evil, and those who cling to decay. Wow, <laughs> selective forest fire. <laughs> Terrible choice of words when you think about it. <laughs> it's like, where do you think rangers come from? Anyway, um... So, to start off with, what do we lose? Well, we lose camouflage, which, I mean, you're playing a ranger that, you know, throws flames everywhere, so that's understandable. And again, stealth isn't a hugely looked after thing. Um, and you also lose evasion and improved evasion, which, you know, hurts in terms of your tankiness. 
especially with spells. And also, you lose your hunter's bond, so no animal companion. And again, you have to get a different capstone, so definitely sounds bad. Uh, but in terms of what we gain, well, let's take a look. At level four, we get Touch of Flame. A Flame Warden can cause his weapons to burst into flame. As a standard action, a ranger can grant a single weapon he holds the flaming special ability for one minute. While under this effect, the weapon counts as magic for the purposes of overcoming damage reduction. A Flame Warden can use this ability as a number of times per day equal to three plus his wisdom modifier. At 12th level, weapons affected by this ability gain the flaming burst special ability instead. Um, it kind of sucks that it's only one minute. The fact that you can overcome damage reduction, uh, some damage reduction with it is certainly nice. Um, just bear in mind, this is this and a lot of other abilities is one of those things where you're going to have to pick send an element of fire to make this really useful. Um, not a terrible choice, though. Um, it just kind of sucks that unlike War Priest, you can, this will only last as long as one minute compared to what they can get. So the duration could be longer, but other than that, it's not terrible. Also, at level four, we get some extra spellcasting spells. We get... Fire Belly and summon small fire elemental to his ranger spell list as first level spells. Wow, those really suck. <laughs> I will say this though, it would be kind of cool, and I admit I don't know much about this, if um, elementals were able to damage enemies as that were otherwise resistant to them if you had the ascendant element. That would certainly make them useful. Uh, at level 7, you get Scorching Ray as a uh, second level spell. That's not a terrible one in the grand scheme of things. And then let's see, at level 9, you get Stoking the Embers. At 9 level, a friendly warden can fan the last spark of a recently slain creature's life force back into a full flame. Once per day is a standard action, a flame warden can touch the corpse of his creature to grant it the effects of Breath of Life, which secures 5d8 points of damage plus 1 per points caster level maximum plus 25 but you um let's see here but of course it has to be uh cast upon someone that has died within one round which kind of sucks uh yeah so that's not terrible it i mean you basically get a uh, fire themed breath of life which is not bad at all it can definitely help give you an extra you know an extra Revive if you absolutely need it. Uh, just bear in mind, of course, that, you know, if you can uh, get to them within a round, so... <laughs> kind of sucks. Because it gives you uh, that extra healing if you do it within time. So you kind of have to be quick on the draw with that. It just kind of sucks, that though, that you're giving this ability to a class that's really meant more for combat than anything else. So, you know, you kind of have to think carefully if you're willing to take that risk. Especially if you already have a cleric or someone within the party that can do that. At level 10, yeah, I get summon medium fire elemental to his ranger spell list as a third level spell. Eh, it's better than the other one, I guess. <clears throat> Nothing terrible, I suppose. I would have liked it so much more if you'd have gotten, oh, I don't know, a freaking fireball! That would be really nice. Um, and then at level 4, or level 13, actually, but spell level 4, of the flame more nats, flame strike, volcanic storm, and summon large fire elementals to his ranger spell list at fourth level. Uh, yeah, they're okay, I guess. Um, volcanic storm is essentially ice storm, but it's fire themed. Summon large elemental. Well, <laughs> other people can summon huge and elder elementals at this point, so this is kind of iffy. I'd say flame strike is the best one of the bunch, just because that's a popular uh, cleric spell. Uh, it's, 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 yeah, you know, it's what it is, I guess. <laughs> and then at level 12, we get Burning Renewal. A Flame Warden can use a cleansing power of fire to remove afflictions from his body, mind, and soul. When a Flame Warden takes 10 or more points of fire damage, he removes the following conditions. Fatigued, shaken, sickened, exhausted, frightened, and nauseated. Additionally, he removes 1d6 points of ability damage and 1d6 points of ability drain from the most damage ability scores of his choice. The Ranger can use the ability only once each time he takes fire damage, regardless of how much damage it deals over the required amount. He can use the ability a number of times equal per day equal to 3 plus his supposed modifier. If the Flame Warden has fire resistance or immunity to fire, fire damage he would have otherwise taken still counts towards activating Burning Renewal. So, that's... I'm gonna say this right now. This is the saving grace of this ability. Otherwise, I would absolutely hate it. 
Oh, what's that? You have something that slightly removes your uh, attack rolls and such? No problem! Just burn yourself! What? Why would you do this? Oh, I don't want to do that! Ah, uh, just, I mean, good freaking lord. I. Uh, I mean, I'm glad it still works with resistance and immunity, so it's not like it's that big a deal, but I mean, the fact that you actually have to take fire damage. It's basically one of those things where, again, you kind of wish you had, you know, other spells that could, like, fireball or whatever that could possibly damage you. <laughs> you do get flame strike, though, which, I mean, if you're playing without mods like me, I can understand why you would only get flame strike. Because a fireball's radius, for the purposes of doing this, is way too wide, so. And then at level 16, we get Phoenix Blast. It's, you know, if a flame warden dies, his body explodes in a conflagration at a 20 foot spread. Each hostile creature near area, thank god, takes 10d6 points of fire damage unless it succeeds a retail save for half damage. The flames don't harm the flame warden's allies, who instead are healed 5d6 points damage, and any poisons that they are currently suffering are neutralized. Well, there's ways to uh, automatically deal with poisons in the game. And personally, I kind of like the idea of, you know, making sure people don't die at all in combat to begin with. But I'm not going to say this is a terrible ability. If anything, this is a really nice ability. And the fact that, you know, you get it before level 20 is honestly pretty damn nice, you know. It can be a nice uh, get out of jail free card in, in the uh, higher difficulty levels. And finally, at level 20, we get Phoenix Rising as the alternate capstone. A Flame Warden gains immunity to fire now and once per day the flame warden rises from the ashes of his own destruction one round after dying the flame warden's body reforms with all his equipment and returns life to have some maximum hit points so again see this is the one thing that sucks about phoenix blast though i mean you get this if you die except if you die you lose the game <laughs> so this is one of those things where you pretty much well, and, I mean, you would have this in any situation, but you really do want to have, you know, a supporter that can, you know, use Raise Dead or Resurrection to, you know, <clears throat> help keep you in the middle of a fight. It's a nice ability to have, though, you know, and I think the game assumes that you would have some sort of Resurrection ability, which makes it useful. Uh, the, t the Capstone, though, honestly, not bad at all. You can only do this once per day, so <clears throat> be wary of how many hours you've been resting before you go out and risk it all again. But it is really cool that you have an ability to reform yourself. So this that's actually a really powerful one. It definitely fits with the Phoenix Team well. So do I think it's better than a regular ranger? Well, you don't get an animal companion, which definitely sucks. Um, And you don't get your evasion abilities either, which can definitely hurt you defensively. But if you're willing to, you know, eat an Ascendant Element fire feed, it's, well... It's not terrible, I guess. It's it's useful in its own way. It has some cool uh, abilities. <clears throat> the Flame Strike in particular is definitely a cool one. And the uh, Phoenix Blast is pretty cool, too. It just kind of sucks that you don't get <laughs> Phoenix Rising before then, but eh, what are you going to do? So I think if you really do like fire and you're okay with not having an animal, which why in the world would you be okay with that, then the Flame Warden can be kind of a fun little alternative to uh, what the Ranger can do. Next up is the Free Brooder, the, the closest thing you're going to get to a pirate in the game. A Free Brooder is a natural leader, a pirate who works well with a variety of people and in a variety of roles. He special, her specialized combat tactics help organize and direct the crew, and Free Brooder's talents are in high demand. Most Free Brooders work as an independent agent. A Free Brooder signs on with the crew when she feels the urge to travel and often moves to a new ship when her contract ends. Really kind of sucks that you don't, you know, get actually write up. Well, okay, you do get to ride the one in the Midnight Isles, but that doesn't help much since you're just going you're going island hopping with that thing. So, what do we lose and what do we gain? Well, it sounds like we lose a lot with this class, unfortunately, because we lose every single flay favored enemy rank. No! And we also lose our animal, uh, Hunter's Bond with Animal Companion, which also kind of sucks. And, of course, we also lose our base capstone, but we get another one in, uh... In exchange, so this definitely sounds like we're losing a ton. Though I have heard from people that the Freebooter is still pretty popular in its own way. So let's still go to each, take a look and see what we gain. At level 1, we get Freebooter's Bane. At first level, the Freebooter can, as a move action, indicate an enemy in combat and rally your allies to focus on a target. The Freebooter and her allies 
gain a plus one bonus on weapon attack and damage rolls against the target. At 5th level and every 5 levels thereafter, the bonus increases by 1. The Freebooters may last until the target dies, or the Freebooter selects a new target. Yeah, you're basically a slayer, except everyone gets the power. Meanwhile, only the slayer is, you know. So that is, yeah, pretty easy to see why the Freebooter is popular with just that ability alone. And the fact that you get it at level 1, and it just gets better and better as you go along... It makes your, you know, people an incredibly effective fighting force. <clears throat> and while it's not as powerful as Mark of Justice, you get to use this as many times as, as you want. Like, no per day, per combat, per whatever. Use it whenever the hell you want. So it's really, really useful and can definitely kick in the clutch when you need it. Next up at level 4, we get the Freebooters Bond, which is basically... Of, uh, let's perform a bond with our crewmates, or your party in this case. This bond allows her to spend a move action to grant her allies extra combat prowess when they work as a team. All allies within 30 feet who can see or hear the Freebooter gain an additional plus two bonus on attack rolls when flanking for one minute. Wow. Have you ever wanted to get out flank without getting out flank? Here you go! <laughs> it doesn't go up as high as plus four, which is kind of the one weakness, but the fact that you get it for free is so, so very nice. Definitely a good choice there. Um, and finally at level 20, you get Master Hunter. At level 20, yeah, Master Hunter. Why not Master Freebooter if you're gonna... Anyway, at 20th level, a Freebooter becomes a Master Hunter. She can, as a standard action, yeah, it's just pretty much the exact same thing. It, they, they just changed it so they could put the word Freebooter in there. I don't know why. That's... What the fuck were you people thinking? Anyway! <laughs> so, is this better than a Ranger? Well, I'll tell you this much. The fact that you get the ability to take what you normally get uh, from a favorite enemy bonus and apply half of it to everyone in a party, even if it's only to a specific enemy, is still really, 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 really good. I mean, the only, the only thing that's better than free attack and damage for your character is free attack and damage for your party. And when you can pull something like that off, it really, really helps uh, things up. And you can use it against literally anyone you want. Technically, you can only use it against one enemy at a time, so you kind of have to pick your target. But all the same, that you get something that your entire party can benefit off of is really, really powerful. And, of course, when they're flanking, you get even more, which is just so, so awesome. I would say the one big thing that hurts this class is the lack of a hunter's spawn slash animal companion. You can use other feats to get it if you really feel the need to. And I think this is one of those classes I can get away with that even without Hunter's Bond just because you get so many combat feats thanks to these uh, weapon style feats that you can get. So I think, you know, if you don't mind not having easy access to an animal companion and various other... If you're okay with uh, having a weaker uh, favorite enemy that you can apply to anyone you want to your whole party, then I think in the grand scheme of things, yes, Freebooter is ultimately better than a Ranger. It's not quite as damaging, but it is much more flexible and more party-friendly for sure. Next, from the Prestige Plus mod, we have Infiltrator. Huh. Come on. <laughs> Didn't know we had two espionage experts here. Some Rangers study their favorite enemies and learn their ways, applying this knowledge to their own abilities and using their foe strings against them. Infiltrators are willing to walk a mile in an enemy's shoes so as to learn everything there is to know about their foes in order to more effectively hunt to kill them. So, what do we lose, and what do we gain? Well, we lose favorite terrain! Oh no, whatever will we do? <laughs> I'm sorry, I really wish I liked that ability more. And that's the only thing we lose, so that's good. In terms of what we gain, well, we gain adaptation. At 3rd level, 8th level, 13th level, and 15th level, an infiltrator learns how to copy unusual abilities for his prey. He chooses one type of creature he has selected as a favored enemy. The ranger gains all features from the adaptation list for that type when adapting. A ranger can use adaptations for one minute per day per ranger level he possesses. They do not need to be consecutive, but it must be used in one minute increments. And these are the things that you get from these creatures. Uh, you don't... These are possible selections. I feel like you should get more than this, I would hope. You know. <clears throat> but, uh... I mean, it'd be nice if you did. But for animals, you get ferocity and intimidating. For dragons, you get great fortitude, iron will, lightning reflexes, and lunge. For dwarves, you get defensive training, hatred, hardy, stability, 
Elves, you get Elven Immunities, Elven Magic, Keen Senses, and Elven Arcane Focus. Giants, you get Lunge, Natural Armor plus two, Resist Energy five, choose one of those three, uh, and throw anything. With Gnomes, you get Defensive Training, no Magic, Hatred, Illusion, Resistance, Keen Senses, and Obsessive. Goblins, you get Goblin Fast and Natural Armor plus two. Halflings, you get Fearless, Halfling Luck, Keen Senses, and Sure Footed. With Fae, you get Great Fortitude, Iron Will, Lightning Reflexes. And with Vermin, you get Great Fortitude, Iron Will, and Natural Armor plus two. So, it kind of sucks that there's no demon choices among the list, and a lot of the enemies you see, you don't really fight all that often, which kind of stinks. So, I would say it's kind of a meh ability at best. It's not terrible, but again, it's just something that might not help you out as much as you'd like. I know there are uh, quite a few Ash Giants in the game, so that's certainly useful. But it would just be nice if there was a choice for the three demon types. But, oh yeah, well. We're not the Demon Slayer, so <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, And you also lose Camouflage, which, eh, again, kind of sucks. So, <laughs> that's literally all you get for the Infiltrator, though. So do I think it's better than the Ranger? Honestly, no, not really. I mean... It's nice that you get these abilities, but they're not what I would call super duper amazing, especially since they're not for many enemies far more common. I'm actually kind of baffled you don't get human. You could just make something up if you can't figure that one out. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a cool idea on paper, and I do like where they're kind of going with it. But it just kind of sucks that, you know... Because I would think that, you know, with however many favored enemies you have on this list, you would have a few more choices here. So, you might. I don't know. It just says possible selections. So, uh, it's worth... Uh, I'll definitely hunt down some more information to see if there's more you can do with the class itself. Bear in mind, though, it is a modded class. So, there's not a lot of info I have on it at present, but I will definitely keep up with it. Uh, but in the meantime, I I would not say this is better than the Ranger, you know? Again, I'm not the biggest fan of Favorite Terrain, but it does add some handy-dandy stuff that I feel is more useful overall, initiative in particular. But if I did have to choose some favorites, I like I do like the ones that give you uh, Great Fortitude, Iron Will, and those uh, stuff like that. So keep an eye out for those, but aside from that, not really anything special. Hey guys, I just decided to go ahead and check out the uh, d20pfsrd.com website, which kind of looks at things from a more tabletop perspective. And the Infiltrator absolutely did have way more options for the adaptation on that site. So I have a funny feeling that all the things that you get as a favorite enemy will be available on here as well. So I wouldn't worry too much about what looks like a reduced list. So yeah, I think with that in mind, the Infiltrator definitely has... a uh, a leg up on being uh, potentially better than the ranger again it's just whether or not it's worth uh losing the favorite terrain over and that i'll just leave completely up to you next up we have the nomad for some rangers living in vast plains their horses are an irreplaceable part of their lives and their bows are a natural extension of their arms so if you played any of the Game Boy Advance Fire uh, Fire Emblem games, you'll kind of know where this is coming from. So, in terms of what we lose, we unfortunately do not get the regular Hunter's Bond, but we have a replacement for it in the end. We also lose out on the basic combat style feats, instead gaining the archery feats, just like the Divine Arms did. And that is pretty much it. We get everything else, so that's really awesome. So what do we gain? Uh, well, we get a horse right at the start of the game. So, and of course, I know a lot of people not big on the horse because it's not a very exciting animal companion. But the cool thing about the horse is that you get it right at level one instead of level four, which making makes the Nomad one of the few ranger archetypes where you don't have to pick that blasted boon companion feat. So that right there is awesome. And of course, even if your horse doesn't come with free tripping, you can still give it the trip feet anyway, if that's all right with you. So yeah, very nice to have for sure. Next up, you get Point Blank Master. At 5th level, a Nomad gains a Point Blank Master feat, ignoring all the prerequisites, which means you do not provoke attacks of opportunity when firing the selected weapon while threatened. I think... 
So for one thing I've kind of learned about with mounts is that they're not worth using with uh, ranged characters because the mounts wind up not really doing anything. Personally, I think it's, you know, it's a whole other character that your enemies have to hit before they can get to your nomad, which isn't a bad thing at all. But part of me does kind of wonder if you're able to pull off a point blank shot on your enemy, then does the nomad's horse get to fight them as well? I don't know if that's the case, but if that is, that would definitely be really powerful. But one thing I do like about it, regardless of whether you can or not, is that this ultimately increases the uh, nomad's battlefield control because they don't have to worry about an enemy, you know, getting up in their faces. They can still hit the enemy uh, very easily, so that's really cool. And better yet, you'll be able to make a full attack when you're making multiple attacks with bow. All of those ranged attacks will not be subject to an attack of opportunity at all. Thanks to Point Blank Master. Really nice to have that for sure. And then at level 10, let's see, that's an archery feat. So, yeah. You get a horse. That's, <laughs> that's pretty much it. <laughs> So it doesn't really uh, sound like it adds a lot, unfortunately. That being said, and I'm going to be completely honest with you guys about something. I think, and you, you can debate me all you want on this. I don't, you know, be civil about it, but I don't care if you disagree with me or not. I actually think the Nomad is a better archer-only class than the Divine Tracker. Simply because of the fact that you get point-blank shot, which I think point like master i should say which is absolutely huge and you know it does kind of suck that you don't get the uh these things for free but the fact that you get a mount at level one that you don't have to waste a feed over to keep it strong is still a nice thing to have for sure um i get that not being able to you know reduce your target's armor class does sound kind of bad but between shamans and witches and other spells, there are plenty of other ways to do that. So I kind of feel like as long as you're, you know, you're okay with taking a little bit more party composition uh, penalties and getting a horse and, you know, free point blank master in exchange for free, mind you. Any of the rangers could get it, but they'd have to spend a feat. But, you know, getting it for free is still very nice. And, you know, I mean, even if you didn't like it, you could still, you know, get those. Actually, I don't know if you can even mention it. Uh, yeah, um... Now... And yes, you don't even need to have a point-blank shot if you don't want it. You just get it right then and there, so... And the fact that you get it, you know, by the time you're pretty much done with Chapter 1 means you'll get plenty of use out of it, so... Yeah, I think in terms of survivability, I think the Nomad is ultimately better than a Divine Marksman, and for someone like me who likes having animal companions don't have to worry about babysitting too much with feats, it's still very useful. Um, I will say, though, that, you know, the Divine Marksman does have uh, its, you know, domain abilities, which is cool. The Nomad, however, gets its spellcasting. So, I think in terms of versatility, um, I'm sorry, I'm um, uh, utility, I should say. The Nomad can definitely... I think it gets a leg up on the Divine Marksman. So that's my uh, personal choice. Um, whether it's better than the Ranger is kind of iffy because one thing about the regular Hunter of Bond is that you have a much wider breadth of uh, animal companions to choose from. So that's worth uh, bearing in mind. And the Ranger can choose melee feats if they want to ride the animal companion anywhere. So I would say the Nomad is worse than the Ranger, but still better than the Divine Marksman. Next up, thanks to the latest DLC... Well, okay, I'm sorry. The second latest DLC uh, content. The one that lets you uh, hang out with the devil a bit more. The Sable Company Marine! Sable Company Marines receive their trainings at the Elite Endrin Military Academy in Corvosa. A large portion of their education is the handling and writing of hippogriffs, the iconic mounts of members of the company. Yep, that's right. You're a wizard, Harry! No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but the fact that you have a hippogriff is a really, really cool thing. Uh, so to start out with, um, 
you do unfortunately lose your initial rank of favorite enemy, but you enemy at least at level one. But you do get at level three, so that's not a big deal. Uh, you do lose all of your favorite terrain, probably because you know you're busy flying all over the place, and you also lose camouflage because it's kind of hard to hide when you got a big ass hippogriff uh, beneath your saddle. Um, you also lose endurance, which, eh, again, I mean, it's nice to have against fatigue and exhaustion abilities, but you don't see those very often in the game, so it's not a huge loss. And you also get an alternate capstone in case of the one that you had before, so you don't really lose all that much with this class, I don't think. In terms of what you gain, well, you're getting a Hippogriff! A Sable Company Marine gains a Hippogriff as a mount instead of choosing the Hunter's Bond class feature level 4, so... On the one hand, you don't get to choose the iconic wolf or riding dog, but on the other hand, you get the Hippogriff at level 1, which means it's equal to your levels, which means, again, you don't have to have that stupid uh, Boon Companion feat, which is nice. While the Sable Company Marine is mounted, he also attacks the target of the Hippogriff's flying attack as a full round action! Range attacks made in this way do not provoke attacks of opportunity. The target is considered flat-footed against Marine's first attack made as part of the flying attack. So that's actually really awesome so if the hippogriff's flying attack lands the uh, ranger attacks too that's yeah i mean so slandered uh put out a video where he kind of detailed uh how the sable company marine works he was kind of inspired to show it off when he saw davrick from the veil guard and i mean i saw that video and it's pretty amazing what you can do in terms of damage with that class so yeah a really, really cool feature to have right at first level. Really lets you show off the power right from the game. It's so nice. At third level, you get the strongest wings. A Sable Company Marine teaches his mount to perform a new combat maneuver. As a standard action, a Hippogriff can create two strong gusts of air with its wings and perform a Bull Rush combat maneuver twice, with a bonus to combat maneuver bonus equal to half its level against targets in a 30-foot cone. If any of these combat maneuvers are successful, the attack big target becomes flat foot against the next attack. So, contrary to what some people might think, you can't uh, knock people prone with a bull rush. All it really does is just typically knock them over. Um, but the fact that you can make them flat footed is absolutely insane. I mean, you can essentially give all of your rogues free sneak attacks without having to worry too much about positioning. So that's that's awesome. Really, really good one right there. And best of all, I don't think it's... Let's see. Well, it says against targets, so it might be friendly fire, so something you'll have to watch out for. But still, uh, chances are your enemy's going to be in the lead, so, you know, you can hit enemies behind it. So, yeah, still really, really cool ability. At level 12, you get Feathered Confusion, a safe company marine teaches it, trains Hippogriff to use its wings for more than just flying. The Hippogriff's wings granted a plus three dodge bonus to armor class against melee attacks. While mounted, the Sable Company Marine receives this bonus as well. The Hippogriff's enemies treat a five-foot area around the Hippogriff as difficult terrain. So, so those enemies that have to close the distance are going to be, you know, be, uh have that much more difficulty in getting to you, which is certainly nice. Kind of helps make you a more effective frontliner. And the extra armor class you get? Hey, that's not bad at all. And it's a dodge bonus, which means it stacks with other dodge bonuses, so thumbs up there. And then last but not least, at level 20, you get the Sable Strike. A Sable Company Marine of 20th level knows how and when to attack his favored enemies. If the target of the flying attack is the Marine's favorite enemy, both the Marine and his Hippogriff automatically score critical hits on their first respective attack made as part of the flying attack ability, and the critical multiplier for these attacks is increased by one. HOLY SHIT! Oh my god! As if you couldn't do enough damage already. That is just incredible. I mean, you don't just automatically confirm a roll for a critical hit, you get the critical hit. That is amazing. Now, it says first respective attacks made as part of the flying attack ability. I don't know if that means the first attack of the battle or just the first attack of the round. I have a feeling it's the former because the latter would be a bit overpowered. But even then, I mean, good lord. They went all out with the Sable Cover. Is, this is like the two... This is like the Titan Fighter of Mounted Class. <laughs> I'm just gonna say it. It's so... 
so good. Definitely powerful. Um, so do I think the Sable Company Marine is better than the Ranger? Uh, uh I don't know. Do, uh, cats eat mice? Really? I mean, you don't lose anything with this. Favorite terrain is... I mean, it kind of sucks, but there are other ways to get your skills and initiative up. The Hunter's Bond, not a big loss at all. I mean, hell, the Hippogriff doesn't need Moon Companion, so you're good there. And even if you can't just, you know, one-hit kill someone with a, a regular attack, which, you know, considering how high Fortitude, enemies' Fortitude saves are in this game, is kind of hard to do, this is a really nice, uh, you know, compromise that just, you know, it's, and it's still incredibly powerful. It just really, really lets you wreck your enemies. I mean, guys, this, dude, if you don't want to be a Demon Slayer, be this. This is just such a cool idea, I mean... You know, it, it, the extra archetypes we got with the uh, devil uh, download of content was, they were kind of hit or miss overall, but Sable Company Marine is an absolute hit for sure. If you like Hippogriffs, this class is definitely a must pick. Next up, we get the Stalker. For those of you who've played, oh, that's it. Uh, this must be a modded class then. <laughs> Actually, no, it uh, doesn't appear to be a, a modded class. If anything, it's literally just a freebooter that's not called the fruit. Wow. Really? Um, okay, why, why is this in the game? I have no idea. It's I, I think it's literally just a freebooter if you don't want to be a pirate, which, I mean, for, first of all, who the fuck doesn't want to be a pirate? You get way more abilities. It's, I mean... Yeah, I think <clears throat> it's somebody, it was likely created by some, I think it's, um, it's, it's got to be from some mod, I just don't know which one it is, but um, I'll, I'll keep an eye out for it and let you know in the, in the uh, description which one it is, but it's probably one of those uh, classes where somebody wanted a free booter Spain without losing all, a lot of the uh, favorite enemy, which is kind of really the only difference, so, I mean, that's kind of cool, I guess. It's the best of both worlds there. <clears throat> Do I think it's better than a freebooter? I... I don't know. Personally, I don't really think it is, simply because the freebooter gets, you know... You already get this huge bo bonus, but then you get an extra bonus to people flanking. And even if you don't get any favorite enemies, the fact that you can use on anyone is still really nice, so... I kind of feel like the stalker is essentially someone who wants to get the freebooter and then stack the, uh favorite enemy on top of it, which in the grand scheme of things is certainly more powerful, but I don't think it 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 doesn't sound party friendly for sure. So I think the fact that the stalker is the only one getting the bonus is what ultimately kind of makes it weaker than the uh freebooter. Aside from that, it's too similar to the Ranger to really come, you know, decide who's better or worse. So yeah. <laughs> there you go. The stalker. This one kind of totally forgot about this one until now. And then next up, well, up, of course, is the Stormwalker. Rangers who walk in the Tempest, unafraid, draw the power of the storm into themselves and become Stormwalkers. Sounds pretty darn exciting, doesn't it? So, what do we lose? All of our combat style feats. And unlike the archery ones, we don't get anything. So that already, that's already bad. Uh, you also lose your uh, Hunter's Bond, so no animal companion for you. And you also lose improved evasion, which just sucks. I mean, anytime you can, you're going to get hit by an enemy's fireball or something, the fact that you can't just take half damage on a regular basis does kind of suck. And you also lose both of your quarries. Oh, that's not good. Oh, wait. Hold on a second. Oh, crap. I lied again. You do get archery. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, kind of funny. This isn't even a doesn't even have, like, a word related to archery, and yet you're just an archer. Which, I mean, that that's bad. Uh, not in my opinion, anyway. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much all you really lose with the class. In terms of what you gain, aside from the archery, level 4, you get Wind Treader. A Stormwalker can wreathe his weapon in lightning. As a standard action, he can grant a single weapon he holds the shock special ability for one minute. While under this effect, the weapon counts as magic for the purposes of overcoming damage reduction. A Stormwalker can use the ability... At 12th level, weapons affected. Yeah, it's pretty much the uh, flame burst, flame burst weapon. Except you can only use it on bows, which kind of sucks because it makes it less flexible. But otherwise, anyway, 
At level 11, you get Flash Step. A Stormwalker can move across the battlefield like a bolt of lightning. As a full round action, he can transform into lightning and move to any unoccupied space within 50 feet without provoking attacks of opportunity. He makes a single ranged attack against the closest opponent after this movement. So, <laughs> definitely very useful in terms of battlefield control. You're not going to get a lot in terms of damage out of it, but the fact that you can go... 50 feet, as opposed to some spells which only let you go 30 feet, still a really nice thing. What I hate about it, though, is that it is unfortunately a full round action. I would have personally preferred it just be a move action, and then you can shoot whichever target you want, regardless of taking uh, the closest opponent. So, one of those things where you want to really want to make sure you have point blank shots as a case. Uh, and then at level 16, you get one with a storm, which gives you immunity to electricity. Congratulations, you're part demon now. Unfortunately, I have yet to see really many uh, electric attacks from enemies. I'm usually the one delivering them, so I don't think that's all that very useful. And then finally, at level 8, 19, you get flash shot. When a storm walker uses flash step, he can make two ranged attacks. Both these attacks are made as a high space attack bonus. So that's a nice little boost, I guess. But is it better than the regular ranger? I... No, I don't think so. I mean, it's not even as good as a flame warden, for crying out loud! I mean, a flame warden just gets so much more, even with what you lose. You know, you get all these extra spells and abilities. Hell, you can come back to life once a day. The Stormwalker... Oh, I can teleport! Yay? <laughs> I'll be honest with you, the flash step can be useful in a flash. Oh, I can see what I did there. But... I just don't feel like, I mean, especially when you reach a point where you can make more than two attacks, it's like, if you have no reason to use it, you're probably not going to use it, so, aside from better positioning, and, yeah, you lose some cool abilities, unfortunately, you don't get quarry, you don't get improved evasion, you don't get a buddy, yeah, no, no, this class just ain't for me, <laughs> if you like electricity, though, it just might be for you. Next up from the Homebrew Archetypes mod, we get the Sword Devil. This is a class that I turned uh, my Windwog into. Agile, vengeful, and deadly. A Sword Devil fights with precision and grace, channeling the difficult lessons of a star across life into an unparalleled par par prowess. Favoring speed and evasive techniques over brute force, Sword Devils choose precision over power and acrobatics over armor. Charismatic and carefree, a sword devil makes fast friends and inspires her companions to greatness, even while vowing a swift death upon their enemies. So, basically, the ranger version of the swashbuckler. <laughs> Actually, there is a swashbuckler uh, that I was able to download in the game, but we'll go over that later time. Uh, what do we lose? We lose all our favorite enemies. No! <laughs> that kind of sucks. So, you're not gonna... And you also lose all of your favorite terrain bonuses, which, you know... It can definitely suck. And you also lose your animal companion and your uh, base capstone and all of your quarry. So you're definitely paying a lot for this class. Can it make up for it? Well, let's find out. At level one, you get Death Vow. At first level, a sword devil may, as a swift action, focus all her fury and determination on a single foe she swears to slay. She may do this once per day, plus one additional time per day at fourth level, and every three levels thereafter, seventh, tenth, etc. The Sword Devil gains a bonus on weapon attack and damage rolls against her sworn target equal to half her Sword Devil level, minimum plus one, maximum plus ten. The Death Vow effect remains until the target of the Death Vow is dead, or the next time the Sword Devil rests and regains use of this ability. So basically, this is essentially a more powerful version of the favored enemy, <laughs> except you can use it on any one you want. So. Yay for that, for sure. Uh, you can only use it so many times per day, so, you know, think carefully before you use it, which, you know, kind of sucks. But, still, what it can do in terms of its attack and damage is honestly not that bad at all. Um, yeah, hell, it's, it's better than a Freebooter's uh, main, so that's really cool, too. <laughs> and then, at um, third level, in place of your favorite train, you get Slashing Fury. The Sword Devil can use her Charisma score in place of her Intelligence score as a prerequisite for combat feats. Additionally, she selects one type of light or one-handed slicing melee weapon. When using this weapon, she may use her Dexterity modifier instead of her Strength modifier on melee attack and damage rolls, so no need for weapon finesse. That's a nice big plus. 
at 8th level and every 5th level thereafter, the Sword Devil may select an additional type of light or one-handed slashing weapons you may use with this ability. This ability counts having a weapon finesse feat, blah, 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 blah. And, of course, you can also get these extra feats if you want them. Um, And, yeah, you, you get a lot of choices with this. You get a battle axe. Really? Okay. Well, that's, that's not bad at all. But, yeah, there's a lot of uh, good choices here, including the ever-popular long sword. So, you got a lot of good choices. I see the only bad thing about this is that you're pretty much going to be a meleeer. <clears throat> but, on the positive side... It's uh, it's incentive for you to pick things like uh, two weapon combat. If anything, I feel like the two uh, weapon combat would definitely be uh, probably your best choice for this. Um, light slash one handed weapon. It doesn't it doesn't say you're not allowed to do it with a shield, so that's certainly uh pretty good. So yeah, definitely a lot of uh, combat choices you can get from that. Uh, at fourth level. You get inspiring example. The sword devil forms a bond with her companions, inspiring them to greater zeal in combat by the example of her weapon craft. As a standard action, the sword devil may grant half her death vow bonus against a single victim of her death vow to all allies within 30 feet who can see and hear her. This bonus lasts for a number of rounds equal to the sword devil's charisma modifier, minimum of one. This bonus does not stack with any death vow bonuses possessed by the sword devil's allies. They use whichever bonus is higher, requires death vow on target. So it's essentially. Again, you basically get um, the uh, Freebooter's Bond, which is really good. In fact, it's actually much more powerful because you get half their uh, half of your uh, you know bonus with that. Uh, so the only bad part, of course, is you don't get it as uh, early as the Freebooter's ability. And it also doesn't last as long, so you make sure your uh, charisma is high. Also, before I forget, you can't cast spells. So again, this is another one of those more combat-focused classes. And also, at level 4, you get Untouchable! The Sword Devil's confidence and personality distract your foes in combat, making her more difficult to hit. When unarmored and unencumbered, the Sword Devil may add her charisma bonus to her armor class and her combat maneuver defense. <laughs> Yes, nothing like dodging your foes by looking pretty. In addition, the Sword Devil gains a plus one dodge bonus to armor class at 6th level, and every three Sword Devil levels thereafter. 9th, 12th, 15th, and 18th, so that's a plus five bonus there on top of your charisma. She loses these bonus when she wears any armor, when she carries a shield, or when she carries a heavy load. So again, it's one of those things where you really have to jack up your stats in order to ensure that your armor is good, but as long as you can do that, that's not bad at all. And I think there are there are a, few, uh, a handful of shirts and robes that I've seen that I wouldn't think count as armor for the purposes of Untouchable, so you could probably still get away with wearing those. So, there's some, you know, propensity for defense there, but the fact that you have a way of getting unarmored defense is still really nice. Uh, let's see. Next, at level 11, you get a... Uh, oh, no, wait. That's a combat style feed. Wait, really? You get a combat style feed? Okay, cool. We get an extra combat selfie at level 11. Why? Wait, what, what am I asking that for? That's awesome! That's great! That's fantastic! I like that! That's really good. <laughs> Can definitely give you some extra choices and kind of a nice way of uh, making up for the lack of spellcasting. And then at level... 19? Yeah, that's slashing fury. Very good. Uh, level 19, you get seething fury. <laughs> At level 19, the Sword Devil's countless battles harden her soul and make her lose touch with her humanity. Her growing lack of control over her wrath fuels the potency of her death vow. She adds her charisma bonus on weapon attack and damage rolls against targets of her death vow and automatically confirms threatened critical hits against them. I mean, considering you're already getting a nice uh, dexterity bonus set, that's really, really good. And considering you're probably going to have your charisma super duper high at this point to ensure that your armor class is good. That's really, really awesome. It doesn't say it stacks with your dexterity, that's, that's probably something to keep in mind, but still, I mean, just awesome. Definitely a good choice. And the fact that you can automatically confirm threatened critical hits uh, makes this class a shoo-in for like uh, feats and such that can boost your critical abilities. So that's really good. And then last but not least, in place of your capstone, you get Avatar of Vengeance. 
A sword devil of 20th level becomes a living avatar of vengeance, infused with supernatural powers that push her beyond the mortal. Recognized for her battle prowess and unparalleled skill at killing uh, by a potent otherworldly entity, the sword devil becomes a living vessel of immortal, intangible, and inscrutable, being obsessed with only slaying her foes, meeting out violent retribution to those who have wronged her, or simply dispatching her enemies in dazzling displays of wanton destruction. As a standard action, the sword devil allows herself to be infused with his killing spirit. She gains aspects of flight, increasing movement speed by 30, and becoming immune to ground effects. A plus 6 morale bonus to armor class, fire resistance 30, and the ability to pounce on foes. This ability can be used for 10 minutes per day, but it must be used in 1 minute increments. Now that is awesome! Immunity to ground effects is nice. The armor class bonus is incredibly useful. Uh, and, of course, the movement speed gives you a lot of battlefield control. Um, <clears throat> fire resistance ain't all that great. There are better ways to beef that up that you get right beforehand. And I don't typically pounce on my foe, so I don't know how useful that might be. But still, you get a lot out of this. Can, that can definitely help you. That really helps you uh, further your abilities as a good melee character. So, is this class archetype, I should say, better than the ranger? Well... If you prefer melee, I would actually say yes, it ultimately is. Again, the lack of a hunter's animal companion does kind of suck. <clears throat> but uh, the crazy amounts of, uh, you know, damage you can do against your foes is still really nice. And the fact that you get, you know, you can get up to plus 10 without needing a favorite enemy bonus definitely makes this an incredibly powerful thing. Uh... Again, it is one of those things where you only get it against one foe at a time, so it's a bit more pick and choosy than the favorite enemy is. But if you know when and how to use it, it can be incredibly useful. And you can even spread half its bonus to your allies, which, you know, I mean, can put you pretty much on par, if not outright past a freebooter. Um, so yeah. The lack of an animal companion is like the one big issue, and of course you also don't get, uh quarry or improved quarry which kind of sucks but the fact that your death valve goes past you know it's basically a more flexible version of uh the favorite enemy can help make up for that so i think if you're looking for a really good melee fighter especially one that uh can use uh dexterity to full effect then yeah i would say in that regard it is better than a ranger and you do lose uh sword no uh, sword spell casting with this class which does kind of suck but the fact that you're so damn good at melee combat, I kind of feel, makes up for that. Next up, also from the Homebrew Archetypes mod, is the Wild Stalker. Civilization grows stronger and more decadent with each passing year. It tears into unclaimed wilderness and destroys a fragile ecology in a constant push for expansion and exploitation. The Wild Stalker forsakes the bonds of community and lives in the trackless wilds far from others of his kind, or perhaps grew up there, never knowing of civilization as anything more than his enemy. He drives pioneers back to civilization and strives to keep the land unspoiled. Ugh. Man, if the Shadow Druid was a ranger, anyway. <laughs> so, to start off with, um, as far as what we lose, we again lose our favorite enemies, which, you know, definitely sounds bad, unfortunately. And you also lose all of your combat style feats. And this time, for sure, you don't really get um, anything uh, as a way of uh, specifically replacing those. So, something to bear in mind, unfortunately. So, yeah, you do. You are paying for a little, a little bit. And moreover, you also lose out on your hunter's bond, so you don't get an animal companion quite so easily. And, of course, you also lose your basic capstone. Would you get another one in exchange for that? So as far as what you gain, well, at the first level, you get strong senses. A wild stalker's life amongst the wild has sharpened his senses. He gains plus one bonus on perception checks. This bonus increases by plus one for every four levels after first to a maximum of plus six at 20th level. So basically, you can find traps more easily. Um, uh, let's see here. Not quite as good as a trap finder, but the fact that you get a nice bonus is not bad at all. It can certainly be helpful for any trickery members in your party, so that's certainly something. Also, at level 2, you get Uncanny Dodge. The character can react to danger before it would normally allow her to do so, cannot be caught flat-footed, nor does she lose her dexterity bonus armor class if the attacker is invisible. So that's a very nice ability to have. 
something that barbarians typically get. And, speaking of which, you're part barbarian because you get Rage of the Wild. A wild stalker gains your rage ability as a barbarian class feature, but its barbarian mode is considered to be as three levels lower than his ranger level, so it's not quite as strong. A barbarian can call upon inner reserves of strength and ferocity, granting her additional combat prowess. Starting at first level, a barbarian can rage for a number of rounds per day equal to four plus her constitution modifier. At each round after first, she can rage for two additional rounds. Temporary increases the constitution such as those they gain from rage and spells. Like Bear's Nurse, do not increase the total number of rounds a barbarian can rage per day. A wild stalker can enter for rage as a free action. The total number of rounds for rage per day is renewed after resting for eight hours, although these hours do not need to be consecutive. While in a rage, wild stalker gains a plus four bonus to her strength and constitution, as well as a plus two morale bonus on will saves. In addition, she takes a negative two penalty armor class. This increases the constitution, grant the wild stalker two hit points per die, but these are disappear when regions are not lost. Loss first, like temporary hit points. While in rage, a wild stalker cannot use any charisma, dexterity, or intelligence based skills except acrobatics, fly, intimidate, ride, or any ability that requires patience or concentration. Um, now, ride isn't a skill per se in the game, so I don't know if you're really going to fall off your animal companion if you use rage while on one. I would absolutely scream my head off if you could. But regardless of the fact that, you know, it's essentially a slightly weaker version of the Rage. It's just treated three levels lower, which kind of sucks. But the fact that you have Rage is still a really nice thing and definitely makes you a good candidate for a uh, melee Ranger. And let's see. At level five, you get Rage Powers. So you get a little something that to make up for the lost combat selfies. As a barbarian gains levels, he learns to use rage new ways. Starting at second level, the barbarian gains rage power. He needs some rage power every two levels. Barbarian and team to second level. And they gain the benefits of rage powers only while raging. And some of these powers require a barbarian to take action first. So, again, still really, really, really cool to have. And there are some really good rage powers in this game for sure. And then, also, you get wild talents as well. You can either take a Rage Power or gain a plus two insight bonus to any one of the following skills. Athletics, Mobility, Perception, Lore, or Self. Level 1 Stalker can gain one of these benefits again at 5 level 6 or maximum 4 times level 20. Not... Mm, I mean, it's not terrible. It's not quite like the skill focus uh, feats, so they're, it's not quite as good as that. But you can get extra Rage Powers on top of what you typically get, so hey, that's not bad at all. I mean... Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You get eight of these fuckers. It's so, so nice. And there are even some rage powers that you can take multiple times. Uh, one in particular that I like being, where is it? Uh, Sweatfoot. 10 foot enhancement bonus for base speed. A barbarian can select this rage power up to three times. It's effect stack, so you can basically travel as fast as if you were mounted, which kind of helps uh, alleviate the otherwise need for a mount. So that's honestly really, really cool. And then at level, let's see here. Yeah, at level 14, you get greater rage, which are very most melee damage, weapon attack, most melee damage, rolls, throwing weapons, and will saves while raging increased to plus three. An additional amount of temporary hit points gained when entering a rage increases to three per hit die. <coughs> now, the strange thing about it, though, is that this one says a wild stalker gains a plus four morale bonus to strength and constitution. So I don't know how that actually translates if the greater rage uses the same calculations as the uh, more typical rage that the barbarian gets. So that being said, though, I have a feeling that, you know, if it works the way I think it, would, it, it does, they probably just stack those on top of what you get here. So... Well, quite likely that the, I mean, this, if it does it that way, this could make the rage incredibly powerful, especially considering that a plus four morale bonus to strength is essentially a plus two bonus to melee attack and damage rolls, so that's not bad at all. But I have a feeling since this is considered an actual strength boost, this might stack on top of that, which could make it really, really useful. And then finally, at level 20, you get Tireless Rage. Starting at 17th level, a barbarian no longer becomes fatigued at the end of a rage. Unfortunately, you're going to only get this at level 20 as a Wild Stalker, so you're not going to get Mighty Rage at the very end, which would increase everything to plus 4, which kind of sucks, so you're not quite doing quite as much damage. 
But all the same, the fact that you can, you know, rage without being fatigued is still a really nice thing. So, yes, do I think this is better than the regular ranger? It's... it's I mean... Yeah... Kind of, sort of. I, I will say for sure, this is not as good as the barbarian class for absolutely certain. Especially the mad dog barbarian that actually gets an animal companion for free. So... It's, yeah, it's it's not a terrible choice, you know, especially if you want to be a uh, ranger that at least gets a uh, favorite terrain. It just kind of sucks that they took away your uh, favorite enemy, because I feel like the bonuses you get from raging don't really keep up with what you can get uh, from the favorite enemy. And the rage, the rage powers are still a nice, uh, you know, uh, alternative to uh, combat style feats, but again, it's just, you know... Something that you might only really take if you really want to have a ranger, a ranger or barbarian hybrid. But uh, otherwise, I would stick to barbarian if you really wanted to rage. And then last but not least, part of the Prestige Plus mod, we get the Witch Guard. Witch Guards are the sworn defenders of the Witches of the North. Although the Witches are spellcasters of immense power, even they cannot defend themselves against every attack. Witch Guards dedicate their lives to protecting their charges and they gain some arcane knowledge in return. They are trained to work closely with witches and defend their mar charges from harm. Witch guards learn magical abilities from the same patrons that grant witches their powers, though they can use uh, their abilities to protect any kind of spellcaster, not just witch. A witch guard is ready to face any foe that might threaten his charge, and he's ever prepared to lay down his life to protect the life of the person he is sworn to defend. Whoever uh, put this one together is a huge fan of Minsk from Baldur's Gate for sure, and man, I am all here for it. So. What do we lose? Well, unfortunately, we lose the Hunter's Bond. Apparently, it's hard to have bond with your companions when you're busy watching over a witch all day, which kind of sucks. And you also lose out on your mini uh, endurance <laughs> uh, your endurance feat, which, again, isn't particularly a big deal. What you do gain, however, is a patron. Oh, yes, you get extra spells. A witch guard learns something of an arcane magic from the witch's he defends. At fourth level, the witch, witch guard gains the ability to cast spells. You must also select a patron as witch class feature. This patron is usually the same as the patron of the witch he is sworn to protect, but the witch guard may choose any patron. The witch guard adds the first four spells from his patron to the ranger spell list. The witch guard cannot cast patron spells at a level he is unable to cast. So, not quite as strong as, you know, what the, uh, basic, uh, basic witch gets since you only get four levels. But hey, you know what's really awesome? You get to be a ranger that can actually cast Fireball! Isn't that awesome, you fucking flame ward? <laughs> so, and in all fairness, I mean, you know, even amongst the four, first uh, four levels, some of these uh, patrons have some really uh, good choices, honestly. Um, uh, the Shadow is a really good choice for those who want to go into more melee, as well as strength. Uh, transformation can get you some uh, extra movement speed and, you know, <clears throat> you can even get, well, Winter I don't think is all that really good. But, um, but yeah, there's definitely some uh, good choices here for sure. So, yeah, it doesn't sound all that amazing, but honestly, I like it. I really like it. In fact, agility is another good one because even with only four spell levels, you get haste. So you, you can be another haster in the party, so that's certainly very useful. And in addition to those, you get Bodyguard at level three. Your swift strikes ward off enemy attacking abilities. You gain Divine Guardian Paladin Bodyguard ability. You also get your defend charge. At fourth level, a witch guard forms a bond with a spellcaster he has sworn to defend. So I think the game's going to look at your your charge's class and determine whether or not you get this ability. Once per day, this bond allows witch card to spend a move action to grant an adjacent spellcaster a plus two dodge bonus to armor class and a plus two circumstance bonus on concentration checks. At fifth level and maybe five levels are after these bonuses increase by two. These bonuses last for a number of rounds equal to the witch card's wisdom modifier. At fourth level and every day levels are after the witch card can use this ability one additional time per day. So... I, it's, it's not terrible, you know, it doesn't sound all that amazing, um, <clears throat> what's hilarious is that you don't get to defend charge until 4th level, and yet, you get the boost at 5th level, which seems like this should be at 1st level, but anyway, 
you know, in all fairness, some extra um, armor class bonus to your uh, wizard is certainly nice. What I really like about it, though, is that it's a dodge bonus and not some other kind of type bonus, which means your spellcaster can use something like ma mage armor or shield to get a nice armor class boost, and this will still help them out with that. Now, granted, of course, you know, you're not going to want your witch to be in the front lines, obviously, but there have been some enemies that will usually go after my more lightly armor companions, so this, this is something that I feel could be very useful uh, in the right situation. And then at 7th level, you get In Harm's Way, which gives you Divine Troth as the Divine Guardian and In Harm's Way as well. So, <clears throat> if for whatever reason the enemies uh, charge your front lines and go after your spellcaster that you're protecting, you've got something that can help out. Um, I think in the grand scheme of things, I feel like this would be uh, more of a melee-oriented witch guard. And considering you're, you know, putting yourself in harm's way, I feel like the weapon and shield combo would be the best... In my opinion, of course. Granted, of course, Minsk uses a great sword, so I wouldn't say no to that one either, especially if you want to, you know, roleplay as Minsk. But hey, not a uh, bad choice at all. But uh, yeah, I might. I honestly feel like doing a Minsk playthrough of this game someday. <laughs> Maybe with the uh, Azada Mythic Path. But uh, in any case, yeah, I would not say the Witch Guard is as good as the Ranger because, again, you do lose your animal companion, which is always kind of a really rough one but if you're one of those rangers that really wants some extra spell casting kick with your class you really can't go wrong with this because you can get some really really good choices out of even just the first four levels as i said you know agility is a good one for haste and elements for fireball and all that stuff just a lot of good choices there it's amazing what you can get even just from the first four uh levels of spell casting so yeah not quite as good as the ranger overall, just because it would be nice if you could have an animal being that could help defend your allies along with you, but it's not a terrible choice, I think. And yes, that is going to be the end of the ranger episode. Again, a very long one. I apologize for that. Uh, I think that the rogue is going to be the last one that's going to be particular, particular length, and everything kind of goes uh, down from there. So that's kind of nice. Um, but yeah, with that all said, that's the end of this episode. So thank you guys so much for watching. Remember, if there's another class that you'd like to see uh, specifically, you just let me know and I'll put that in the next video. Otherwise, we'll just keep going on down the alphabet. Uh, but yeah, thanks again for watching and I do hope to see you in the next one. Until then, take care of yourselves and I wish you interesting adventures. Farewell. <laughs>